Hello and welcome to Something to Think About with the British Bible School. My name is Mark Hill, I'm a graduate of the school and it's my privilege to be working with the congregation that meets in Northampton uh, in England. And there is much for us to think about, isn't there? So many things that are going on, not only around the world, but on our own doorstep. Currently, there is a leadership race, a leadership race. This is uh, something that's happening politically at the time, and a new leader is needed for one of the political parties, who, which will automatically then make them the prime minister of this country. What about leaders? What do you think about them? Not politically, but generally speaking. Why is there a race to leadership? Because people think they know better than everybody else and they want to be the ones that put their policies in place to save all of us. Unfortunately, all too often, all we think is that these people, and I'm sure there's many of them that are sincere, but we feel there's many of them that are just in it for what they can get. It's never been any different and one of the things that this has caused me to to think back to is the book of Judges in the Old Testament where people didn't raise up their own leader oh no that happened later and it's when it went wrong but when the people needed it God would raise up a leader for them you see without the book of Judges we would have very little knowledge of what transpired between the time of Joshua and the time of Samuel as a result of its being in the Bible, we have this continuation of the story of God's people, the history of them as they settled into the promised land, having been rescued and brought out from Egypt where they were slaves. They're now coming to a land where they'd live in houses they didn't build and benefit from fields and harvests where they'd not planted. The need for a king eventually became important to them, but until then, God was supposed to be their king. You see, the events in the book of Joshua, Joshua, Judges, underlines the truth that rebellion against God brings punishment, but repentance brings restoration. This is an integral part of the word of God. If you sin, if you do wrong, there is punishment, but you can be forgiven. You can turn from it and have a restored relationship with God. Judges itself is an account of some of the greatest heroes of the Bible and God's dealings through them with his people. Some of these people, of course, don't appear as great or as good as we might expect them to, but they were guided by God's laws nevertheless, and they were encouraged by his promises. Now, although there are those who would be drawn away into idolatry time after time, the tabernacle service, according to the law of Moses, was still kept in existence, and there were those who kept to it. The judgment passed on the crimes which were um, recorded is in keeping with the action of a people who were motivated by a holy calling. At that time, it wasn't a case of just do as you please. But what does God want? We know that that changed eventually. Now, some of the men that were chosen wielded great influence on their contemporaries. For example, in the case of Ehud, it said, After his victory, the land enjoyed rest for 80 years. Imagine peace throughout the land for 80 years. Also, Barak, after his victory, it said in the same way that the land had rest for 40 years. Now, it's not certain that these men lived that long, much less that they governed for that long. But they and others were raised up by the Spirit of God to give a particular service when there was an occasion needed. As a result, the influence of their leadership was felt for this specified length of time. During their careers, these leaders purged Israel of their idolatries. They avenged Israel of their enemies. They championed the cause of righteousness. So, during the government of the judges, God was, in a particular way, Israel's king. Now, in Judges chapter 2, verses 6 to 19, it explains why the Lord raised up these judges. After the death of Joshua, the people remained faithful to God, 
for only as long as that generation that knew Joshua was still alive. Those people who had seen all the great things that God had done through Joshua in going into this land. But we're told in verse 7 of chapter 2, there arose another generation that did not know the Lord, nor the works he had done for Israel. And then, sadly, in verse 10 of the same chapter, we read that the people forsook Yahweh and served the Baalim. These, of course, are the idols of the country that they'd now settled in, especially of uh, Baal and Ashtaroth. Now, the result of the people's idolatry was that in anger, God, they mo God gave them over to their oppressors. Those in Canaan were organised socially and polit politically and culturally. They weren't a pushover for anyone who wanted to take over their land. That Israel could overtake a people like this at all in the first place proved God was with them. New nations in the area east of the Jordan River, raiders from the Arabian desert, Canaanite and city-states and the Philistines became the chief plunderers of the loose federation of tribes that constituted Israel at this particular time. The period covered by the Book of Judges would be something like 300 years, and Israel was 12 tribes bound together in a common religious covenant to Yahweh, their God. In fact, the tribes gathered together for the central religious occasions at Shiloh. In addition, certain emergencies produced concerted tribal action in the name of the God who had made the covenant with them in Sinai. There were things that held them together, and God was their leader. So what about the judges? Where do they come in? What was a judge? A judge of Israel were leaders in a time of crisis. The Hebrew word for judge that's translated judge is not really an exact equivalent of the meaning that we have in our thoughts of a judge in English today. A judge was more than a person who presided over legal court proceedings. He was a ruler, a, a military deliverer, a redeemer in fact. God himself was the supreme ruler and the government of that particular era has been called a theocracy because God was the king, a government in which God was the real power. Now when these judges were lifted to their office, they ruled for their lifetimes, and as a group they led Israel in unbroken succession from the time of Joshua through to the time of Samuel. Individuals prompted by the, the inward irresistible impulse of God's Holy Spirit were moved to achieve deliverance for his people. Usually their rise to power was accompanied by a special call. The people, seeing them endowed with this extraordinary courage or strength, accepted them and submitted to their rule, although one or two of them needed convincing by God that they were the person that God needed. These men, unlike the kings of the surrounding territories and in Israel at a later period, were without pomp and ceremony. No wonderful uh, uh, ceremony to see them into their position. They didn't have the power to make laws, because the laws, of course, were given by God. They didn't even have the power to explain the laws, because that was the task of the priests who lived amongst the people. But on the other hand, they upheld the law. They were avengers of crimes, particularly of idolatry and its attached immorality. They were great military leaders and in them the people of Israel began to find a visible expression of unity which later culminated in their asking for a king. Now unlike the office of a king which uh, was usually passed from father to son, the office of a judge was not hereditary. An individual became a judge by virtue of a special calling of God. When they were called up by God to deliver the people from their enemies, they would then continue to administer justice to the people in civil matters. Remember, they've arrived in a land which is to become their home after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years and after many centuries of slavery in Egypt. The period of the judges was as disturbed as any in the history of Palestine. Israel had not captured all that God had told them, 
nor had they clan cleared the land of all the influences that God had intended them to clear. So there was no real unity amongst the twelve tribes just yet, but there were certain ties which should have held them together. That of family. They were all descended from Jacob, from the sons of Jacob, and their faith, their religion, since they'd all agreed together to enter into this covenant with God at Sinai. Now each tribe was inclined to look after itself and that made it easy for invaders to overpower them. After all, the invaders did not come in to overpower all the tribes of all the land. They only subdued the different tribes which occupied parts of Canaan, which had been allocated to them by Joshua. It appears that the different tribes didn't always spring to each other's defence. This was because there was no real central government. There was no recognised leadership to pull the people together. When Joshua died, there were no others with his, uh, his strength of character and his courage to take over. So each did what was right in their own eyes. And the fact that there was no king is stressed repeatedly through the book. Now the repeated sequence or cycles that can be identified in the book of Judges are that there's sin. Because of sin there is punishment. With punishment came repentance and with repentance came salvation. So God, uh, God's people did what was evil by serving their false gods. Yahweh then sends an oppressor to teach Israel a lesson. The people cry out in distress uh, and pray for a deliverer to defeat the oppressor and God answers that call. The land enjoys rest until the judge dies and then guess what? The people fall back into idolatry. The twelve tribes didn't keep the covenant with God. Disobeying orders which involved the breaking down of pagan altars of those remaining inhabitants of the land so that they wouldn't be used, so there wouldn't be a temptation to go back to it. These remnants were to be a constant source of irritation and aggravation to the Israelites, a thorn in their sides. In verse 1, as we begin to read the book of Judges, we're told that these things took place after the death of Joshua. The events that happen from chapter 1, verse 1, through to verse 9 of chapter 2, all happen during the lifetime of Joshua. And we're told that he asked the Lord. Special direction is given to Joshua because he asked the Lord. So let's note some lessons for us. Before Joshua does anything, he asks the Lord. He talks to God about it. Now if this great man of God thought it was important, shouldn't we? We need to ask for God's direction about the things we do in this life, in our everyday life, not just church decisions, but things that affect our life with God. Do we ask before we even make the decision? Or do we make the decision and ask God to bless it? If we believe in the providence of God, we need to let God be a part of our life. We must ask God because he knows best. There's a passage in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 42 verses 3 to 4. And there's a remnant of God's people that's been forced to watch their brethren carried off into captivity. And they say to Jeremiah, Pray for us to the living God, that he may show us the way we may walk, and the things that we may do. Now what they did was right, of course, but their attitude in doing it, we find, was wrong. They wanted to go to Egypt. They'd asked Jeremiah to tell them what God wanted them to do. It wasn't for ten days that God replied, and then he said, Stay in Judah. What did they do? They ignored what he said and went to Egypt anyway. James says, Do not be double-minded. Don't ask if you don't intend to listen to the answer. In fact, only ask God if you're going to obey. Now how do we ask? We pray. We verbalise these things to God. And we search the Word of God, the Bible. We search it to find advice and wisdom concerning that thing that we might want to do. We should seek the wisdom of fellow believers. Don't just do what's right in your own sight, 
talk to others about this as well people that you trust that you know have studied God's word that are people of prayer then they might also pray for you in Judges chapter 1 and verse 2 the reply comes back that Judah shall go up Judah is prepared to obey the answer that God has given in this particular instance having gained confidence in God's reply Judah asked Simeon to come with him and help he wasn't doubting God but he recognized something sometimes it's good to do things with other people there is confidence in having company the right company you increase friendships by doing things together you get to know others better by working in harmony together you can even increase in patience as you work with someone else and you have to get used to them and the way they go about things you learn to be able to understand each other both your strengths and your weaknesses we do have an individual faith but we really do need each other as believers the scriptures say as iron sharpens iron so does a man's countenance his friend Jesus in the New Testament sent out 70 disciples two by two to go and teach others the Holy Spirit sent Barnabas and Saul and even when they separated they went with other people one may have wisdom the other might know how to apply it so that's a formidable force one person might have courage the other might have caution and between the two of you you find the right path one might have great wealth and can fund things but the other might have the wisdom to know how to best use that wealth no one has all of the qualities needed to make things work we need to work together share our abilities and responsibilities we ought not to lord it over each other but value the contribution each can make to the cause ahead even when God wants us to have elders, overseers, shepherds of a congregation, he wants there to be a plurality, not just a leader calling the shots. Another lesson is that these are, 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 are leaders and there are some who were followers. Some were natural leaders and others were natural followers and both are needed, both are important. Neither is to look down on the other. Or to despise the other Judah was helped by Simeon and forever after was the predominant of the two tribes but it didn't detract from their work together we always talk about Judah who mentions Simeon Andrew brought Peter to the Lord Peter of course gets all the accolades do you think Andrew thinks I wish I'd never brought him he always gets all the applause he always gets all the attention of course not it was too great a servant for those kinds of thoughts we need to work together in the great task that God has set before us and no matter who receives the praise we need to make sure that God gets the glory for what we manage to achieve you see some are sowers some are reapers we shouldn't be looking for the glory of either of those things but in working together for the good of the kingdom of God the end result is that God, God's work will be achieved God will be glorified because of the unity and the harmony seen in his people personal pride and glory are set aside as God's people are seen working together for the good of all and not just wanting what's good in their own sight Remember in the second year of the exodus from Egypt, the twelve spies were sent out into the same land and the report came back that the land was good, there was great beauty and richness in the land. However, there are giants and there are fortifications that are strong and if we try to capture this place it would be the death of the Israelites. And the people went against their leader Moses. Therefore God was turned against Moses was just speaking on behalf of God so they suffered the consequences of dying in the wilderness 
instead of going into that beautiful land when they could. Caleb was one of the spies that said, we can take this land. And here, many years later, we see him do just that. He put to death the sons of Anak, despite their size. He captured their cities, despite their fortifications. Everything that the other spies said couldn't be done. Here he was doing it 40 years later. And he was doing it because he trusted in the promises of God. And he allowed himself to be used by God. He was a leader because he submitted himself to God. Truly that's the triumph of real faith. And what about us? Have we got our ideas? Are there ways in which we want things done? Are there things that we are calling for? Is the challenge before us too big? Or is our faith too small? What are we going to do? Verses 21 to 36 of uh, Judges 12, 2 says that the, uh, the weak faith produces weak action. You see, the people failed to keep their focus on the high aim that God had set before them. They were content with partial possession. Sorry, that reading was from, from Exodus. But are we the same? Are we content with a measure of holiness that's far short of the high calling to which we are called? Are we too busy trying to make an impression to people around about us that we're not submitting ourselves to God for him to use us in whatever capacity it can. Do we aim high enough in trying to gain knowledge of the Bible and God's word? Do we aim, aim high enough in the character that we're trying to develop in Christ? Are we godly? Are the things we are doing done for the glory of God? In victory over sin or in self-control or in heavenly mindedness, are we the victors and are we humble about it the spies thought that the iron chariots were invincible so they shrunk away from the valleys and slunk away into the vastness of the hills and that's the same for those of us with little faith the challenges of the world are too much for us to bear and we lose heart and we slink away from the battle with our tail between our legs when anybody asks we say well it's their fault they made me do it. The country's in the state it's in because of them and because of that leader and because of this problem and that problem. But the country can be in a greater state if we are the kind of leaders that God calls us to be. If we have the courage to lead where godliness is concerned. We can't take on these great massive machines of immorality and immoral teaching and leading people astray into immorality and passing laws that make it legal to do those things that are against God's laws. But one by one, by our character, by our building in our knowledge of the Bible, by our sincerely asking for God's help, we can help lead another person to Christ. Let's not try and just do things as we see fit in our own eyes, but in the eyes of God, what is he calling us to? Let's not underestimate the power and the grace of God. He has said, my strength is sufficient for you. But are we willing to lean on him? And most of all, will we trust each other to work together to conquer our land for Christ? Yes, at this moment in time, it doesn't matter when you might be seeing this, but at the time of me speaking this, there's a leadership race. Well, make God your leader. Let him lead us through these difficulties in life. And may he lead us to other souls that need saving. Let's have the strength and the courage to do it personally and join forces with others that God's name might be glorified. Thank you very much for listening.